What's up, everybody? We have 10-ish minutes, as usual, here, and Mr. Ryan Muckenhearn's across the table, so you know it's going to be a good one, and actually, not only is it going to be a good one, it's also going to be one of the most important things you've heard all day. So if you're listening to this in the morning, you're not going to hear really anything else this important the rest of the day, so you might as well just head back home, crack a beer, and just sit back and relax. My goodness. Just just call it. <laughs> yeah. We did you a favor. You're welcome, everybody. Does that mean we get to do that too, Jim? Yeah, in the future. Uh, <laughs> so <laughs> It's on Saturday. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. All right. So, Ryan. Yes. Weighted gun vices. Yes. That's something we see a lot of people go out and use during the sight-in process, during some sort of a process where they're checking something and they want to eliminate themselves from the equation, essentially, right? They want to see basically what the gun is capable of if they weren't even there. And it's an apparatus which you set your gun in. It is weighted in order to not fly around as you pull the trigger. Uh, And it kind of locks it in place. Just clamps it. It sounds, Jim, it sounds like some sort of torture device, which really is maybe kind of accurate. Because it's kind of torturing your firearm. It is a bit torturous. So, Ryan, we actually recommend against the use of this type of equipment. Exactly. And uh, this is this is probably one of those things where, you know, we're going to get a few people that disagree with us. That's okay. But at disagree, least... Disagree at least, below. Yeah, disagree. Actually, yeah. Yeah. Only Actually, only agree with us below. If you disagree, just take your comments. No, I'm just kidding. But, uh, all right. Let, let us... Hear us out here. Yeah. All right. So, Ryan, explain why it is... That we don't recommend. I'm going to lead off with a car analogy oh because this okay. is the best one that I have because we get this call a lot. And especially now, it's late July. People are getting ready to head out into the field. So they're getting their guns sighted in for, for the upcoming big game seasons. Imagine driving a manual transmission car um, and you want to do a burnout. Okay, So you push your clutch in, you put it in gear, you redline it, and you drop the clutch. Uh, in typical fashion, wheels would break loose, big cloud of smoke, we peel off into the night. Um, this bird. is all sounding like really good stuff. Yeah, I don't know yeah. where how we're gonna get. Back You're to not the part talking, Jim, out of weighted gun vices. This right is correct. Now. I'm gonna, well, I'm gonna we, turn. I'm right. gonna turn the tables. So that goes on. Free birds playing. You peel yeah. off down the county road and, and you have a good time. Safety first, please. Now do that same process, but put a brick wall in front of your vehicle. Put it in gear. Clutch in. Red line. Drop the clutch. What happens? We have this enormous transfer of of torque energy from the motor to the transmission to the drivetrain to the wheels and then the typical thing that should happen is the vehicle propels forward dissipating that energy and if it's well built it shouldn't blow up when we can't move forward when we can't dissipate that energy if we're lucky the wheels break loose and we just stay stationary if we're not lucky all of a sudden we like break a u-joint break a drive shaft blow a transmission bend a rod say we've got mega sticky tires yeah catastrophic failure right so with these weighted gun vices, while they are convenient and they do take recoil out of the equation, which is generally what we see people gravitating you know, towards them for, when you fire that weapon, that recoil energy has to go somewhere. And the correct place for it to go is through you, the shooter, acting as a spring, dissipating that energy into the ground. When we have that rest there and we pull the trigger, that recoil impulse goes through the gun and bounces right back off of the thing that's capturing it in the rear or clamping it up front, dumps it right back into the system. And from the optic side of things, what we generally see happen is like inside of your optic, when you fire your weapon, things are flying around. They're supposed to. They're designed to do this. Um, but they're not doing it at the right rate and frequency. And we see lens displacement. We see um, erector tube failure. Uh, we see turrets even manipulate Mm -hmm. which is crazy to think like when you put resistance, like enough resistance to turn a turret and you feel how much that takes um, to think that you could do that without touching the turret is pretty wild. In even worse scenarios, we see base screws shear off due to the weight of the scope and these small fasteners that hold these base screws on. We see action screws shear. We see stocks split. More interestingly, we generally see not great accuracy. And this is kind of very interesting because it's somewhat Counter, counterintuitive. Yeah. yeah. Like you think, okay, you've got this nice stable shooting platform, which they are, um, and you're eliminating that human error component. Well, when you pull the trigger, right, your your barrel is going to flex and whip like a noodle. Mm-hmm. We're now interrupting that natural process mm-hmm. by dumping that energy, that impulse back into it. And now that, that, that frequency in which that barrel reverberates and, and moves is changed wildly yeah you you effectively have a different tune yeah to your rifle 100 percent. i was just in a gun vice versus when it's being held by you yeah we talked about barrel 
tuners before, a variety right. of different yep. types of barrel tuners. And I would actually venture to guess, Ryan, even if you were able to get like a rock solid zero, right? You've mm-hmm. got it in the weighted gun vise, you get this rock solid zero, you adjust your turrets. It might be off when you actually shoulder the rifle and shoot it naturally in yep. your hunting or regular shooting scenario. Yep. You Absol- don't have a zero. Absolutely. Absolutely it is. False zero. Yep. And it's kind a lot of this bleeds into archery kind of too. So I'm not a good archery shooter. What I have noticed is that depending on how I hold and touch my bow, put torsion and torque on it, the grip strength I have when I'm I'm holding on to the grip of my bow and and really any of the other contact points, if I change them shot to shot, my grouping is very erratic. Similar principle here. Yep. The bow really can't be held hard. It's got to be almost just kind of cradled and held in tension in the palm of my hand. Um, and as minimal points of contact on that, that equipment as possible when I take that shot. And it has to be repeatable. The weighted shooting rests kind of do the same or similar things when we're pulling the trigger. And this all happens in like a millisecond. And so for the folks that are going to be like, whoa, 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 hold the phone. I've been shooting out of one of those for 20 years. You may not see an issue, and we've tested this too. In fact, Travis Baran uh, in our NPD team and I headed out with our Barrett M99, uh, which is a 50 cal, and we put like 100 pounds on one of these devices so that it was completely immovable, and we shot, I don't know how many rounds of 50 BMG, a lot. No ill effect. Scope was fine. I've used them with lighter weight rifles that have maybe a little faster recoil impulse and cataclysmic failure. Mm -hmm. And every year, once we start getting close to hunting season, the number of calls that we have come in where folks are like, my optic does not hold zero. And we start going through the checklist, ring placement, ring torque, ring style, base is secured, ammunition, muzzle devices, are they attached securely, are they loose? And one of the last questions is, are we shooting out of one of these weighted devices? And if that answer is yes, the first thing that we recommend is take that out of the equation. Switch to a bipod in a rear bag or switch to sandbags in a rear bag. Literally anything stable except these devices that capture and contain the recoil of that rifle. And more often than not, the follow-up is it shoots good. Mm-hmm. And those things that you mentioned, grab a couple of sandbags, use a bipod with a rear bag. Mm-hmm. Using something like that, you can still achieve a really good zero. And in my opinion, too, the other thing is you can get behind the gun more comfortably yeah. and more closely to how you would be shooting within yep. the field. And so you take out even mechanical accuracy of the firearm. Let's not even you know get into that because, as we've discussed, that will, it will and can be and likely will be affected. But also just your accuracy as a shooter. In my opinion, like you were talking about with the bow, why set everything up perfectly and practice not the same way that you're going to do it in the field. And then when you Correct. go out in the mm-hmm. field, you do it a different way when it really counts. Yep. That would be, I mean, there's there's so many analogies that you could go into. It's like some Olympic sports player wouldn't practice one way, and then when it actually comes down to the final hour, do everything completely differently yeah. right. um, and expect the same results. It's just not not the way things work. Well, and I think also you look at, I mean, a lot of folks, including myself, whatever, you have limited time to practice, right? Mm-hmm. So some maybe a significant portion of your practice time would be actually zeroing that mm-hmm. rifle, and why take that away from yourself? Yeah, well, and I think some people, they look at that limited time and they think, well, I don't want to fuss around with me getting shaky. I don't want to fuss around with all this stuff and have to be chasing groups around so if I can just lock it in place, you know, shoot a, a couple of groups, make adjustments, and be done with it, then that's great. They actually think it'll save them yeah, time. Then I know. But what we see so often is that it, it increases the amount of time and frustration that you have because you have these mysterious head-scratcher Open up, you know, opening up groups. You've got uh, it's not tracking the way that you think it should be. And energy, energy is just such a weird thing. You oh know? yeah, like it, it. Uh, I mean, there's the whole law of the conservation of energy. It doesn't disappear. It just transfers into other things. Yep. And so, and I, th- I think when people hear about, like you're talking about, how things inside of a scope move under recoil, that's not a fault of the optic. It's supposed to do that. If yep. it didn't do that, it would break way more often. And uh, it's the same way, you know, like uh, when you're talking about shooting and, you and, you know, the barrel whips like a noodle. I think a lot of times people don't realize that stuff moves mm-hmm. in, in real life. It we, has to. It has to. Because yeah. if it doesn't, 
I mean, and yeah, you're bringing up the the car analogy, which I was thinking on. You know, a lot of people talk about adding power, adding stiffness to the chassis, all this stuff, and then like putting really sticky tires on on a car or something like that, and then they start breaking things. And it's because mm-hmm. the energy has to go somewhere. Yep. It's going to find the point of least resistance, which yep. is usually the little things that are holding everything together, yep. like little action screws, yep. little ring screws, yep. little tiny fasteners all throughout your scope that are very precise and designed to recoil in a very specific way and, and take energy in a very specific way. Well, I'll, I'll throw this out there too. Those are little things that are not obvious things all the time no. either. So now you've kind of created this, like you said, this mysterious thing or you're trying yeah. to fare it out like, well, what the heck could it be? And it actually maybe on the surface it looks fine, but then it's not fine. Mm-hmm. You got yeah. a headache on your hands. Oh yeah, I mean, not many people out there with just sort of the average knowledge of optics are going to think, "Oh yeah, what's going on is my you know erector unit and the gimbal, and there's a leaf spring in there, and that must be." De- I mean, that's just it's. We don't blame anybody for not. Well, thinking I'd say it. this it's just. It's not like this is like a vortex thing. Like we'll get folks that come in like, "Hey, I'm having all sorts of trouble with my scope and my system, X brand, whatever brand, right?" Like I'm, you know, I want to look at one of yours. And then you guys start, you know, predominantly you guys, Ryan, and consumer sales. I mean, you're front lines with these, you yeah. know, asking them a series of questions. And it might not even, you know, it's kind of the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. You know? and, I, yeah. We go, and like I said, we go through it every year too. And it's not just a scope thing either. And I want to touch on a quick example that I have but without bringing this to 35 minutes. Gentleman had a bolt action straight wall cartridge gun hmm. that was giving him all kinds of fits. We took the gun, we zeroed it on the range, shot fantastic. He took it back, all kinds of fits. It didn't even have that much recoil either because it had a really efficient muzzle brake on it. And he was very comfortable and versed in shooting high recoil guns. I'm racking my brain on this and, and he brings it in again and it's the scope is starting to migrate in the rings. And I'm thinking, this is nuts. Like, they're good rings, they're torqued at proper values, everything's buttoned down. And I start going through the system and the action screws are completely loose. Like they're, they're holding on by nothing. They're threaded into the receptacle, but they haven't made it to the shoulder where they bottom out. Mm-hmm. And the muzzle brake is loose now. I'm thinking, what is the deal here? And so we run through everything, get it all reset, zeroed in, shoots fabulous. Like minute of angle or better at 100 yards. Process repeat, we end up in the same boat. And we start going through this, um, you know, inquisitive nature here. Find out that he's shooting in one of these devices. And... I start talking about what's happening here. And literally that, that interruption of that normal recoil sequence was loosening his action screws, allowing his action to move fore and aft in the stock, which is causing this kind of hammering action, which is allowing his scope to migrate, <laughs> which in turn is then allowing his puzzle <laughs> device to loosen up. That's crazy. Yep. So we went through everything, secured everything with thread locker on that, which could be thread locked, torque to spec, everything was set up. He's avoided that that device, yeah. and it's never happened again. So it's wow. not it's not just an optical failure, but yeah. it's also nope. firearm system failure too. Yeah. So. And we've and I, countless times too. If you're listening to this and you have a scope that's not a vortex scope or something like that, and you're just you know you're scratching your head again, like we said, there's been all sorts of times where people have called and they're like, "Well, my X Y Z isn't working, so I'm going to give you guys a try." Yep. And I mean, I know when I right. when I've been in your guys' shoes in the past, I know what you guys do a lot of times is, well, hey, let's figure out first why that one's not working. Yep. Because if you're doing something that's just going to make any scope not work, it, you're going to get frustrated with us. You're going to get frustrated with the next company, the next company, the next company. So anyway, well, and also just just frustrated in your in how you want to enjoy your optics and firearms life. Yeah, I yeah. mean, yeah, we're talking about limited time, limited time to hunt, shoot, whatever. I mean, you yeah. want to maximize that. So yeah. Now I know there's a there's a different thing out there than what we're describing, which is called free recoil. But I do kind of uh, I do kind of subscribe to the whole like you know let the ri- re- the rifle recoil freely uh, as many of us do. You know in terms of where your shoulder is and all that stuff. That's that's a different thing. But uh, free reezy, free reezy. <laughs> that's what I was getting to. So hopefully this is maybe uh, if anybody out there was having issues they just couldn't quite figure out maybe this has given you a little bit of an inkling to what it might be something you could try yeah I don't know take this info to the range arm your friends with knowledge as well and uh, if you have any questions as usual hit us up in the comments below if you're watching on YouTube or over on Instagram at Vortex Nation Podcast we would love to hear from you and uh, yeah also if you're using anything that works really well I mean. Like we said, sandbags in a bipod or, you know, sandbags all around works great for us. If you found something else, 
that's super effective at keeping the gun steady, uh, but it's allowing the gun to recoil the way it wants. Yeah, let us know too. Be cool. Cool. All right. We'll see you guys on the next one. See ya. Bye. Bye.